Peak Performance Section 1 The Growth Equation Chapter 4 One of our friends, Adam, name has been changed to protect our friend's identity. He's an engineer on Google's self-driving car project, now its own division called YMO. He says, the daily pace of work borders on, on fanatical. When he isn't in love, the outside world disappears. We know this because tell, he tells us so, and also because our text messages and emails ha to him almost always go unanswered. Adam works full time, full tilt, wholly immersing himself in the brains and guts of a car that, if Google got it right, will be a total game changer. Adam, however, will never say that. He knows that he and his team must figure, first figure out, among many other things, how to teach an inanimate object moving at 70 miles per hour to differentiate between a straight plastic bag and a straight there. Talk about a just manageable challenge. Google is built upon projects like the self-driving car and the boards that push the point of resistance for growth, where struggle and productive Failure aren't consequences of work, but rather the driving forces behind it. The company attracts the cream of the crop, top-notch creative thinkers who are passionate about what they do. Add to the mix tight deadlines and the colleagues who aren't scared to push the envelope, and it's easy to see why employees like Adam become so absorbed in their work. <coughs> Google has nailed the recipe for stress, but the company understands that's only half the battle. Without test, without rest, Google wouldn't end up with innovation. Instead, it end up with a for workforce that is broken down and burned out. Burnout, burnout is undoubtedly one of Google's gra gravest threats, and holding back passionate employees is often a far more form formidable challenge than pushing them ahead. Fortunately, Google has brought the same innovative mindset to this dilemma, as the company has to all its other projects. But unlike just about everything else that Google does, the company isn't helping its employees rest by looking ahead to current-edge technologies. Rather, Google nails, nails rest by looking back to ancient Eastern practice. Search inside yourself. In the early days, Google employee number 107, Chait Meng Tang, observed that while he and his Colleagues had no problem. The observed that while he and his colleagues had no problem turning it on, they struggled mightily to turn it off, taking short breaks, let alone disconnecting from work in the evenings and on weekends, was impossible. Even if early Googlers, Googlers wanted to rest, the pace and thrill of their work made it hard to go to do. Google was growing fast, but then had the wisdom to realize that this style of work stress without rest was unsustainable. At Google, Tang was a software engineer. Outside of work, he was an avid practitioner of mindfulness meditation, a Buddhist style of sitting meditation in which the practitioner focuses solely on the breath. Tang's mindfulness practice helped him to transition from the stress of intense work to a more restful state. He also found that it opened his mind to otherwise hidden insights. Mindfulness Mindfulness, mindfulness, Tan decided was exactly what Google needed. So in 2007, Tan launched Search Inside Yourself, a seven-week mindfulness meditation course for Google employees. At first, his colleagues were reluctant. They questioned, what if anything, a mystical new age could lead the, ch the ch chanting practice could do for them. But it wasn't long before Tan's colleagues learned the mindfulness which of course is none of the things we just mentioned, had the power to change the way they worked and lived. Soon, Googlers who went through Tang's class were raving about its benefits. They felt calmer, clear-headed, and more focused. They were able to unplug at the end of the day and even detach enough so that weekends and vacations became truly, truly rejuvenating. Word spread quickly through the halls of Google about search inside yourself, and it wasn't long before demand for those
course surpassed Tan's ability to teach, something he was doing in addition to his engineering job. <coughs> Google's leadership team couldn't help but notice the benefits of search inside yourself. Either their employees were healthier, happier, and more productive. They approached Than and asked him if he'd be interested in teaching mindfulness meditation full-time and leading a new department called Personal Growth. Than was floored by the offer and took it, with only one condition. His job title will no longer be software engineer. He'll now be called Jolly Goodfellow. Search inside yourself, continue to grow eventually beyond the walls of, of Google. Today, the Independent Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute, S-I-Y-L-I, S-I-Y-L-I, operates with an expanded mission and teaches mindfulness to individuals in a variety of organizations. <coughs> Tan remains intimately involved as chairman of the board, though he still prefers his colleagues refer to him as a jolly good fellow, where he leads a staff of 14 full-time employees who are dedicated to spreading the power of mindfulness. To learn more about mindfulness meditation, we visited SIYLSI in San Francisco's Presidio District. There, were, there we met with Brandon Reynolds, a mindfulness teacher. Reynolds is about 30 years old, but his hair is gray, graying as if to say the wisdom of mindfulness fills his head. Fills his head. And from that we could gather it does. Upon first meeting Reynolds, we couldn't help but notice that he is fully present. None of his movements are without intention. He focuses with a deep gaze that soaks up every detail of his surroundings. When we walked into a conference room, presumably one runner's one runner has been in a hundred of times. He observed the room as if he was walking up onto a ledge of, of to observe the Grand Canyon. The same thing happened when he, he opened his laptop. He looked like a four-year-old discovering a MacBook for the first time. Runners was taking it all in. Seemingly abstract by things we consider ordinary. Renel tells us Renel told us he wasn't always like this. Prior to S I Y L I, he worked for a large management management consulting firm. Though he was good for the job, an opinion confirmed by promoting promotions and strong performance reviews, the job wasn't good for him. Reynolds noticed himself chasing external rewards and craving status. He found it hard to focus, something almost impossible to believe given that we witnessed at SIYLI, and he could never calm his racing mind. He told us that even when he wasn't physically at work, his mind was there, like the early Googlers. Renner Reynolds simply couldn't turn it off, but he says that all changed when I got. Uh, it was. That all changed when I got serious about mindfulness. Three years into his work as a consultant, Reynolds stumbled upon a few articles and a book about mindfulness meditation. He started studying the practice, and much like Dan of Google, he saw in mindfulness a solution to many of his problems. He committed to meditating regularly, staying with a one-minute session every day. After just a few weeks, Reynolds noticed profound changes. He became more aware of himself and his emotions, and more convinced of how those emotions, emotions precipitated certain, act, certain actions. His mind still raced at work, and when he was actively problem-solving, but he was able to quiet, quiet it at the end of the day, he listened better and he slept better, too. Reynolds told us that, as, there, as he ramped up the duration and frequency of his meditation sessions, he began to feel more in control of himself and no longer at the behests of the world around him. It was as if every element of my life improved, he recalls. Turning it off from stress into rest. It is not that light runners don't feel pain and discomfort during their hard workout, it is just that they react differently. The calm conversation goes something like this. This is this is starting to hurt now. You should you should I'm running hard, but I am separated from this pain. It is not going to be okay. The adage that hard work separates the best from the rest only explains part of the picture. The best rest harder too. 
turning it off from stress into rest. <coughs> Mindfulness is about being compl completely present in the moment, fully aware of yourself and your surroundings. It is helpful to think of the meditation parts as highly specific training for being more present at all times of your life. When you meditate, you are strengthening your mind muscle. It is a simple practice. Sit in a comfortable position, ideally in a quiet space. Breathe deeply for a few breaths, in and out through your nose. Allow your breath to settle back into its natural rhythm and focus on only the sensation of breathing. Notice the rise and fall of your abdomen with each breath. If thoughts arise, if thoughts arise, notice them, but then direct your focus back to the rhythm and sensation of your breath. Set a time so you don't have to think about time. Start with just a minute, one minute, and gradually increase the duration. More recently, brain studies are beginning to show the immersed and measurable benefits of mindfulness meditation. Researchers are finding that stating at just a few minutes every day, mindfulness meditation increases great matter in the part of the brain called the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is one of the most evolved parts of our brains. Its, compl compl its complexity separates us from more primary animals. In addition to performing higher order thinking, the prefrontal cortex serves as the, as the brain command and control center. It allows us to respond thoughtfully to situations instead of inst instinctively re reacting. Having a well-developed prefrontal cortex is especially important when it comes to transitioning out of, out of stress and into rest. When we challenge ourselves, whether running a hard workout, learning wo how to play a new instrument, or work tirelessly to solve a complex problem, we are triggering a stress response in the brain. By strengthening our prefrontal cortex, mindfulness allows us to recognize that we are having a stress response rather than automatically being overcome by it. It is as if we are viewing our thoughts and feelings as neutral observer and then choosing what to do next. A weak prefrontal cortex gets overpowered by, by a strong stress response, but a strong prefrontal cortex lets us choose how we want to respond to stress. To better understand how this works, works out, how this works, researchers at the University of Wisconsin Madison designed an experiment that allowed them to observe both inside and, and out. More on this in a second. The difference between how no, novice, novins, how novice and expert meditators respond to stress. The researchers began by burning the legs of both groups with a, scale, a scalding hot wire. <coughs> At first, both groups responded the same way, with an immediate stress response. Ouch. But that was about the only thing the two groups had in common. In addition to watching the participant outward responses, the researchers were also watching how things unfolded internally, using fMRI scans that let them see inside their participants' brains what they saw on their inside mirror, exactly what they saw on the outside. At first, the brain region associated with the initial response to stress, the secondary somatosensory cortex showed the same level of activity in both groups. This represented the earlier ouch. As the stress response continued, there was noticeable activity in the amygdala of the novice group. The amygdala is one of the less evolved structures in our, in our brain. We share it in common with even the most primitive animals, like rodents, often referred to as the emotional center of the brain. The amygdala controls our most basic instincts, such as hunger and fear. When we sense a threat, it's the amygdala that triggers our stress response. We become tense and brace ourselves for action. While this may be helpful for evading predators in the wild, it is not optimal for keeping our cool when faced with modern day stressors. The activity in the norm novices, amygdalas, as evidenced by the fMRI, shed light on, on why they continue to struggle with pain and discomfort. Their brains were experiencing what neuroscientists call amygdala hijack. An emotional takeover of the brain. The simple, they simply couldn't turn off their stress response, even after the scalding hot wire was removed. The novices, when the novices remain in a stressed out and emotional state. The ex expert meditators, on the other hand, demonstrated an entirely different reaction, both inside and out. After the initial burn, they were able to turn off their, their stress response. Disassociating their stimulus from an extended ex 
emotional reaction. It was as if they felt the pain. Thoughts, ouch, that hurts. And then consciously choose not to react any farther. There was no amygdala hijack inside the brain of the expert meditators. They were able to overcome their innate stress response. This is an extreme example of this ability, of the same ability that allows the SIYLI mindfulness teachers Brandon Reynolds to turn, out, turn it off at the end of the hard day. It just so happens that experienced meditators aren't the only experts who can actively choose how to respond to, to stress. They like run, runners that Steve coaches can too. This is another example of how achieving excellence in similarly distant pursuits, running and meditating, ends up having a lot in common. When pain sets in, during a hard, long workout every day, runners, and even pretty good ones, often get wrapped up in it. They think to themselves, oh crap, this already hurts so much and I've got a long way to go. This emotionally charged thought can lead to panic. Heart rates rise and mu muscles tense. As a result, both enjoyment and performance diminish. But for the best runners, like the ones that Steve coaches, it is a different story. It's not that elite runners don't feel pain and discomfort during their hard work workouts. It is just that they react differently. Rather than panicking, they have in their minds what Steve calls a calm conversation. The calm conversation goes something like this. This is staring, starting to hurt now. It should. I'm running hard. But I'm separated from this pain. It's going to be okay. You like the experts, meditators, the best runners, choose how they respond to the stress of a workout. The amygdala are not hijacked. Although, not all Steve's elites runners meditate, they all develop a strong mindful muscle through the years of deep, solidarity focus that being an elite runner demands Steve hasn't demands. Light runner demands. Steve hasn't scanned their brains, but with wager that if he did, he'll find their prefrontal cortex are bursting with gray matter. <coughs> On his journey to become an light runner, one of Steve's athletes, Brian Basara, experienced what numerous young runners do in their first time race, failure. When Barraza was a Frenchman at the University of Houston, he had a chance in the fitness to qualify for the 10K National Championship. But instead of finishing in the top 10 like he had all year, Barraza finished a disappointing 28. Following the race, Barraza told Steve, that hurt a lot, I just could never get comfortable. Steve spent a year working with Basara, helping him learn how to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. In particular, he told Barraza to accept that every hard workout or race was going to hurt, rather than re resisting the pain. Steve told Barraza to have a calm conversation. Fast, for fast forward, a year later to the same race, and, a and as a sophomore, Barraza took home fourth place clinching a spot at the national championship. This time not only was Barroso's finishing place different, but so too was his post-race report. When it started to hurt, I imagined you were next to me, just like in practice, Barroso told Steve. It was like I was having a simple conversation in the middle of the race, first with you, then with myself. When it started to get really difficult, I didn't try to force my, my way through the pain or fight against it. Instead, I reminded myself this is normal and I relaxed. As a junior, Barroso ran out of his mind and won the qualifications meet. No doubt, his physical fitness certainly improved over the course of his collegiate career, but it was the improvement in his mental fitness that allowed him to fully express it. Being mindful doesn't just help the best athletes get through hard workouts, it also helps them to recover. We need not look farther than heart rate variability, HRV, or the space between heart rate heartbeats to prove HRVs. HRV is commonly used as a global indicator commonly used as a global indicator of physiological recovery. The faster someone's HRV returns to its pre exercise val exercise value baseline, the better. Research shows that following hard training, the HRV of elite athletes returns to baselines far faster than the HRV of non elites. In one study, 15 minutes after a strenuous exercise, the HRV of a light athlete had already returned to 80% of its baseline value. The HRV of non lights, however, was at just 25%. After 30 minutes, the HRV of a light athlete had returned to normal, whereas the HRV of non lights remained at only 40 to 45%. Much like the light meditators, the light athletes were able to transition from stress to rest much faster than their more novice peers. Perhaps, 
The adage that hard work separates the best from the rest only explains part of the picture. The best rest harder too. The best rest harder too. Developing your mindful muscle creates a space for you to choose how you want to respond to stress. In the middle of a challenge, mindfulness helps you remain calm and collected. It lets you devote all your physical and psychological energy to completing the task at hand. Not worrying about it after a challenge, mindfulness lets you choose to turn it off the stress and transition to a more restful rate state. As we've seen, this might mean showing your residing mind or slowing your racing heartbeat. Whether you are an engineer or an athlete, mindfulness serves as a getaway to rest, helping you get there faster and more predictable. But as we're about to discover in an interesting twist, when you enter into that restful state, rest turns out to be anything but passive. Performance practices, five bullet points. <coughs> Grow your mind muscle. The best way to do so is by practicing mindfulness meditation. Choose a, fine, choose a time when other distractions are minimized, such as first thing in the morning after brushing your teeth or before going to bed. Sit in a comfortable position, ideally in a quiet space. Set a timer so you aren't distracted by thoughts about the passage of time. Begin breathing deeply in and out through your nose. Allow your breath to settle back into its natural rhythm and focus on nothing but the sensation of breathing. Noticing the rise and fall of the abdomen with each breath. If thought arises, notice them, but then let them go. Direct your focus back to the sensation of the breath. Start with just one minute and gradually increase duration of adding 30 to 45 seconds every few days. Bullet point number two. Frequency trumps duration. It's best to meditate daily, even if that means keeping individual sessions short. Bullet point Number three, apply your growing mindfulness abilities in everyday life. Bullet point number four, have calm conversation during stressful, stressful periods. Bullet point number five, relax when you want to turn it off and then choose to leave the stress behind. Pausing to take a few deep breaths helps to activate the prefrontal cortex, your brain, brain's command and control center. Our brain at rest, the default mode network, the default mode network. In 1929, a German psychiatrist named Hans Berger was conducting a series of studies using a new technology he had invented just five years prior. The technology was called electro, electroencephalogram, electroencephalogram or EEG for short, and it mapped electrical activity in the brain by attaching sensors to the scalps of his patients. Berger could acquire an inside look at their brains. His objective for using this device was to understand which parts of the brain perform different tasks. He asked patients to answer arithmetic questions, instructed them to draw or have them solve puzzles, all while he monitor, monitor, monitor the electrical activity in their brains. Sure enough, he was that different pattern of electrical activity occurred with different types of tasks. Berger, in his EEG, gave us a whole new insight into how the brain works, and also into how the brain doesn't work. During one of his experiments, Berger left the EEG machine on while a patient was resting between tasks. He noticed that the EEG needles responsible for tracing electrical activity in the brain didn't stop moving, rather they continued to buzz frenetically. At the time, prevailing wisdom held that the brain essentially turned off when not performing a concrete task. But here was Beggar, watching his patients' brains remain extremely active even when they weren't actively doing anything. When Berger published his findings, the part about the brain being active at rest was largely ignored, although Berger was quite intrigued by what was happening when this, his patients were actively working. The rest of the scientific community was far more concerned with what was happening when they were. For the next 70 years, research focused on the task positive network of the network in the brain that is activated when we perform a forceful attention demanding task. It wasn't until 2001 that Marcus Reichio, Reichio, me, MD, a neurologist 
a neuro neurologist of Washington University in St. Louis, re-engaged re with the puzzling, positive activity that Bergen had discovered a lifetime ago, using fMRI scans to look inside the brain. Ritchie found that when people zone out and they dream, a particular part of the brain consistently became active. He called this the default mode network. Interestingly, as soon as Rachel's subjects started focusing again, the default mode network went black and the task positive network became active again. Thanks to the help of more illuminating fMRI technology, unlike Beggar's discovery from almost a century ago, Rachel's works prompted more scientific inquiry, inquiry on the brain at test. This body of research shows that even the, when it feels like our brains are off, a powerful system, the default mode network, is running in the background, completely unnoticed by our unconscious, unconscious awareness. And as we're about to see, it is this system, one that is on when we are off, that is often responsible for, for creating insight and breakthrough. Breakthrough. Eureka! How to use it in creativity? Our most profound ideas, it seems, tend to come from the small spaces in between otherwise deliberate thinking, when our brains are at rest. When our brains are at rest. Reflect to the times when you are most creative. What are you doing when the answers to tough problems you've been grappling with suddenly pop into your head? Odds are you aren't trying to solve them. It is more likely that you're zooming out into the shower. They are zoning now into the shower. If so, you'll be in the company of Wooden Alley. Allen relies on the shower for a creative spark. He says whenever he's at an impasse, what will help me is to go upstairs and take a shower. So I'll take off some of my clothes and make myself an English muffin or something and try to give myself a little chill so I want to get in the shower. When it comes to generating creative thoughts in the shower, Allen isn't alone. As evidenced by an entire industry of waterproof whiteboards and notebooks. If not in the shower, maybe your best idea comes to you when you are on, on a run or a walk. Maybe it's team philosophers from Kierkegaard to Thorio held their daily walk as something sacred, the key to generating new ideas. Methics that the moment my legs be, begin to move, my thoughts begin to flow. Thorio famously panel in his journal, or perhaps your epiphany comes when you wake up to the, use the bathroom in the middle of the night, or when you first emerge from a nap. The best investors often sleep with the notebook on their hands. Thomas Edison was an enthusiastic proponent of power naps, not because they helped him catch up on sleep, but because he'll wake awake from, the, from them with new ideas. Lynn Manuel Miranda MacArthur Fellowship Genius Grant, winner and creator of the blockbuster Broadway musical Hamilton, puts it like this. A, a good idea doesn't come when you're doing a million things. The good idea comes in the moment of rest. It comes in the shower. It comes when you're dawdling or playing trains with your son. It is when your mind is on the other side of things. Piece the interesting anecdotes together and a powerful theme emerge. Our most profound ideas often come from the small spaces in between otherwise deliberately thinking when our brains are at rest. Science bears this out. Researchers have found that despite spending the vast majority of our working hours in effortful thought, over 40% of our creative ideas manifest during breaks. Most creative discoveries adhere to start standard art. First, we throw ourselves into the work, intensely deliberating on a topic. While our conscious mindset, minds gets us pretty far, every so often there is a missing piece we just can't figure out no matter how hard we try. When we reach this point, though it seems to con counterintuitive, it seems when we reach this point though, though it seems counterintuitive, the best thing we can do is to stop trying. Often if we step away from intentional and active thinking and let our minds rest instead, the missing peaks mysteriously appears, just like the really better and runner. Then a castor, whom you met in chapter one, said the magic of, of her success lies in stepping away from her physical training. The magic of generating creative ideas lies in stepping away from the forceful thinking. In order to better understand this magic, we must turn to the difference between the conscious and subconscious mind.
our creative our creative brain our creative brain when we are actively working on something our conscious mind the task force in that work runs the show it functions in a linear and logical if then fashion if this then that if not this then probably not that in the vast majority of activities this sort of linear thinking serves as well but every once in a while we get stuck we may sit and stare at the computer the screen or the whiteboard trying to figure out something out but so long as we're still trying we're likely to fail it's only when we stop trying that our conscious mind fades into the background and our subconscious mind the default mode networks takes over it's only when we turn off the conscious mind shifting into rest the insights from the subconscious mind surface our subconscious mind functions in an entirely different manner than our conscious mind it breaks from the pattern of linear thinking and works much more randomly pulling information from parts of our brain that are inaccessible when we're consciously working on something. It is in these parts of the brain, in the vast forest bordering the narrow, if then, highway that our conscious minds run on, where our creative ideas lie. Neuroscientists have found that the subconscious mind is always working, dully running in the background, but like Rachel discovered, it is only when we turn off the conscious mind shifting into this, a state of rest that it's from the subconscious mind surface. A mathematician named David Goss, PhD, has first-hand experience with the phenomenon of creativity emerging during periods of rest. Goss is Professor Emeritus of Mathematics at Ohio, at Ohio State University and is internationally recognized for his groundbreaking work in number theory. He spent the past four years creating an entirely new mathematical language in which we can solve problems that cannot be solved in traditional language. In effect, he created a parallel universe for making impossible math problems impossible math problems possible. In order to access the creativity, the creative insights that led him to develop this parallel universe in math, Goss had to access a parallel universe in his mind. Goss' love for numbers go back as far as he can remember. In the early 1970s, when Goss was a Frenchman at the, a freshman, freshman at the University of Michigan, he threw himself fully into math. Math, he told us, was all he could think about. Although his performance in math classes was extraordinary, it came at the expense of everything else. He neglected, of course, work outside of math. During his junior year, it got so bad that his advisor told him he needed to shape up or ship out. Ghost chose the, la the latter, setting sail for Harvard, where he was welcomed with open arms into a mathematics PhD program. He told us, I've got a master in a master's and PhD from Harvard but no undergraduate degree, oh well. Relief of the need to fake in the other disciplines, Goss went on a tier in math. When he was 23 years old, it struck Goss that math was bounded by its current structures. I remember thinking there, there got to be a better way, a means to advance math beyond what we think is possible, Goss says. This idea and many of the groundbreaking ones that will follow didn't come to him at the checkboard, rather he says all these crazy ideas come to me via my subconscious. When I was on the exercise bike or just walking around, some of these ideas were in fact crazy, but others turned out to be not so crazy at all. He disposed of the crazy ideas the next day, but the not so crazy ones, they turned into a second language for math. The subconscious is a crazily powerful thing, Ghost told us. It is almost like the sole reason you do the work is to set the stage for what happens when you step away. There is no doubt about it. Ghost had a brilliant conscious mind, but it is his subconscious mind and his courage to step away from work and rest so that he can tap into it that deserves equal celebration. The subconscious is a crazily powerful thing, Ghost told us. It is almost like the sole reason you do the work is to set the stage for what happens when you step away. Although Ghost was never a serious athlete, he was following the art of per periodization, stressing his mind, his mind and, and then letting it recover only to find new ideas to grow. Ghost isn't the only game changer who experienced unpre unprecedented success when he stepped away. Next, we'll turn to the story of another great performer, this time a serious athlete, whose, whose courage to rest yielded a different kind of break breakthrough. It is the story of a runner named Roger Bannister. Performance practices. 
six bullet points. First bullet point. When you are working on a strenuous mental task and, and hit an impasse, stop working. Bullet point number two. Step away from whatever it is you are doing for at least five minutes. Bullet point number three. The more stressful the tasks, the longer your break, your break should be. Bullet point number four. For really draining tasks, consider stepping away until the next morning. Bullet point number five. During your breaks, if you aren't sleeping more than this soon, perform activities that demand little or no forceful thinking. Though, we'll explore in great detail how to fill your breaks in chapter five. Some examples include listening to music, going on a short walk, sitting in nature, taking a shower, doing the dishes. Bullet point number six. You may have an aha moment of insight during your break. If you do, great. Even if you don't have an aha moment during your break, your subconscious mind is still at work. When you return to whatever it is you were doing, you'll be more likely to make progress. Breakthrough. By framing rest as something that supports growth and adaptation, Dixon's at least stop viewing rest as passive, as not training, and just like that, rest becomes as productive as an additional, as an additional workout. Breakthrough. May 6, 1954, Oxford, England, bang, with the firing of the starter's gun, in front of a jam-packed stadium, British track star Roger Bannister started his assault on the impossible running a mile in under four minutes. In the 1940s and 1950s, the mile, like the marathon of today, was running's most prestigious event in the same way that today's running community can't can stop talking about the possibility of a soft two hours marathon. Just through the years, running community was obsessed with the quest for a, for a soft four minute mile. The record had been progressively lower by four minutes and 14 seconds. 1913 to 4 minutes 6, six, six, six seconds 1934 to 4 minutes and 1 second 1945 but there are single snaps of the fingers away from, from the epic soft 4 minute mile the record stood for almost a decade it wasn't for lack of trying the best runners from all over the world declared they will run soft 4 their training was designed specifically to break the barrier but without fail they all came up short 4 minutes and 3 seconds 4 minutes and 1 second, 4 minutes and 4 seconds, 4 minutes and 2 seconds. No one, it seemed, could shave off the final couple of seconds. Physiologists and physicians began, began to doubt as south for a mile was even possible. Man's heart and lungs could not withstand the demands. The reason. Like all the other great runners of the time, Vanisher had come close enough within mere seconds to think he could break the barrier. So. When he declared in early 1954 that he'd, got, he'd go for the record again, Bannister truly believed he'd get in, but before taking on history, Bannister made that seem, what seemed like a very questionable decision. He abandoned his training of intense, intense intervals on the track and instead drove off to the mountains of Scotland, only a mere two weeks before the race. For days, he and a few bodies didn't speak of, let alone a track. Instead, they hiked and climbed in the mountains. They completely checked out of running psychology, psychologically, and to a great extent physically. While hiking is a great activity for developing general fitness, it is far cry from the blistering 400 meters repeats that Bannister's was accustomed to running on the track. In other words, relative to his normal routine, Bannister was Bannister was was resting. Upon returning to England, Bannister once again shocked everyone in the returning community. Instead of immediately hoping on a track in a fit of compulsion to do something, panic training in the hopes of making up for lost time, he continued to rest. For three more days, Bannister let his body recuperate from the demands of the training he'd just put in during the months prior. With just a couple of days to go before the record attempt, Bannister completed a few short workouts to tune his body up, but that was it. Bannister was physically fresh, and this was a good thing. He would need every last bit of energy to redefine what was possible in running. Back on the track on Oxford on May 6, 1954, with only with only one runner nearby, 
Bannister came through the third lap in 3 minutes and 7 seconds. Slightly off the soft 4 pace. Then, when the battle rang, signifying the final lap, Bannister burst into a maddening drive as he slowly pulled away from the field, everyone in the crowd rushed the, to their feet. 3 minutes and 40 seconds, 3 minutes and 41 seconds, 3 minutes and 42 seconds. Down the final stairway, the energy was palpable, fans screaming at the top of the lungs. 3 minutes and 54 seconds, 3 minutes and 55 seconds. As Bannister crossed the finish, the finish line, unaware of anything other than how hard he was pushing himself, the crowd roared. The stadium announced Norris McWither, who will go on to found genius world records, burst on the loudspeakers with his most memorable, memorable call. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the result of every event 9, the 1 mile. First number 41, R.G. Bannisters, Amateur Athletic Association and formerly of Ex Exeter and Merton Colleges, Oxford, with a time which an is a new meeting and a track record and which subject to ratification will be a new English na nat native, native, British national, all comments, European British Empire and world record, the time was there. The crowd erupted and the rest of the announcement faded into oblivion. In 3 minutes 51 seconds and 4 ten of a second, Roger Bannister had broken one of the greatest barriers in human history and he was in no small part due to his courage to rest. Although Bannister escaped to the woods, it is a big stream the notion of taking breaks to facilitate physical growth in anything but that. Whereas Matt Dixon, a prominent coach of the world's top three athletes, what separates the best from the rest? The answer he told us is the rest. Sure, it takes a sage like Dixon to effectively balance training across straighton, three disciplines, swim, bike, run, but Dixon's real magic is how he convinces his athletes to rest. By framing rest as something that supports growth and adaptation, Dixon at least talks beyond rest as passive as no training, and just like that, rest becomes as productive as an additional workout. No different than professionals in any other highly demanding industry, three athletes are eager to push. They see their competition putting in endless hours of training and feel like there is always something more they could be doing. Unlike in pure running, where athletes are often show restrained for fear of broken bones. Triathlon includes the non-impact non -impact sports of swimming and cycling. In the sports, at least see little reasons to hold themselves back, and many don't. As a result, three athletes, perhaps more than any other type of, of athlete, suffer from overtraining syndrome and burnout, but not so with Dixon's athletes. Dixon tells us, Dixon tells us somewhat reluctantly, that he has become known as the recovery coach. This is in no small part because so many overtrained athletes, bearing down and all on the brink of burnout, turn to Dixon to save their careers. Dixon says that the hardest part of getting athletes to rest is convincing them that doing so will benefit them more than additional training. Once they make that jump, once they make that jump, he says, then it is easy. The athletes start gaining more fitness and performing better than ever before, for the first time in their careers. He told us. They are give, giving their bodies time and space to adapt to the training stress. In order to help his athletes make his crucial jump, Dixon frames rest as an active choice. Dixon is taking advantage of something behavioral scientists call the commission bias or our innate preference for action over inaction. When Dixon writes training plans for Iron, Ironman tri, triathletes, there are no easy or off days. There are, however, plenty of sur points. Sur Plenty of supporting sessions. By framing rest as something that supports growth and adaptation, Dixon at least stopped viewing rest as passive, as not training. And just like that, rest becomes as productive as an additional workout. This simple shift in mindset enables Dixon to do what so few coaches can, convince his at least to rest. Like Benisters, Dixon's at least show up to big races, not just filter, but also fresher than their competitors. They win major races not because they train harder than their competitors, but because they rest harder than their competitors. In a society that glorifies grinding, shortening gains and pushing to extremes, it takes guts to rest. Just as Dixon does with the three athletes he coaches, perhaps he, we will all reframe rest. Rest isn't lazily soothing, slow, slothing around, 
It is an active process in which physical and psychological growth occurs. To reap the benefits of stress, you need a rest. In the next chapter, we turn to the question of what exactly is the best way to rest. We present the science behind the rest breaks of various durations from short pauses throughout the day to the critical importance of sleep to extend by vacation and explain how you can strategically maximize the, maximize the unique benefit of, of each type. It is our hope that when you see how practical and powerful these breaks can be, you will feel better about actively choosing to take them. Thank you.